Oh, yeah. Renowned author. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wonder who we're talking about. I'm going to come back to this slide in a couple minutes. Isn't this a great venue, by the way? Mm -hmm. How many people have been out to Dominguez Pass? Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> you know, I hate talking of, talking in front of people who know more than I do. Um, this is a panorama from from uh, the past. Uh, just a bunch of photos stitched together. Just a, it's an astonishing uh, landscape. Um, and I'm sure you all know where it is. Many of you know where it is. But just to just to. Uh, remind you, here's Paige in the uh, upper right, uh, uh, Colorado River running <coughs> from upper right down to uh, the lower left there, and uh, <coughs> right there is Lee's Ferry, about uh, 10 miles from town, of course 40 miles if you're driving, um, and a little further north there's uh, Dominguez Pass right there. Um, you can get to Dominguez Pass uh, starting from East Ferry, going up to Korea and, and climbing out, or you can come from the Page side uh, across the huge <laughs> sand trap that we call Ferry Swale. Oh yeah, and there's Horseshoe Bend for those people who care about those things. We're going to mention Horseshoe Bend <clears> once. So. Um, the Dominguez Escalani expedition. A really interesting subject. I'm really going to treat it very lightly tonight, just talk about the section I'm interested in. But uh, two Franciscan friars left Santa Fe, New Spain in 1776, trying to blaze a new trail to California. Um, they went quite far north in Utah, all the way up uh, to the Provo area. And, uh, then uh, by the time they got a little further west, they decided it was too late in the year, and they decided to come back to Santa Fe. They didn't have enough time to make it. And on the way back, they ended up at this place they called uh, San Benito de Salsipuedes, or what we call Lee's Ferry. Uh, they found that a dreadful spot. They felt hemmed in by all the mountains around them. Uh, San Benito is a reference to uh, the robe of contrition that friars sometimes wore as punishment. Uh, and then salsa is get out if you can. So they were quite trapped. They couldn't get across the river too, too deep. Uh, the people that uh, tried to swim uh, almost drowned. And they tried to build a raft and so on. They finally sent a couple of scouts out to go up uh, the Perea, what they call the Santa Teresa. And uh, they managed to find a spot to climb out. And so the whole party went that way. And, uh, and, uh, crossed on November 2nd in 1776. And this is just a uh, pictorial uh, of, uh, of the route. Uh, a very nice uh, section of uh, uh, the map called Utah Historic Trails. Um, the Dominguez Escalani uh, approximate route is shown in green there. If you can see, can anyone see it? It doesn't even stand out too well. And then that heavy black line, of course, is the Utah-Arizona border. Utah lock likes to put this section of Arizona in their maps because they think that this, uh, this section ought to belong to them. <laughs> that uh, that uh, Arizona Strip, uh, west and north of the Colorado River. But we're not going to give it back to them. <laughs> um, but they ended up here. Uh, they came across the Fredonia area and uh, went via what we call the Winter Road now, if you're familiar with that back road. And they ended up uh, in the House Rock Valley. And they knew they were looking to cross the river. And uh, uh, they knew that it was a wide spot in the river and quite shallow. So they knew what they were looking for. They had a little bit of intelligence from uh, some of the uh, Native Americans. Um, but they didn't have enough, because when they got to House Rock Valley, they turned south. And uh, this is where they were trying to get to, what, uh, what was commonly called Ute Crossing, or Navajo Crossing, if that's your affiliation. 
Um, but uh, they would have really cut their trip short if they had gone north in House Rock Valley. But they came south uh, around the Priya Plateau and along uh, um, uh, the Vermilion Cliffs and ended up at uh, Lee's Ferry. Uh, here's the way Escalani, Escalani kept the journal, of course. Here's the way he describes climbing out uh, at uh, Dominguez Pass. It took us more than three hours to climb it because it has a very sloping sand dune for a start and afterwards extremely difficult stretches and most, most dangerous ledges and is at the very last impassable. <clears throat> so I want you to remember that at the very last impassable. I'm going to come back to that. In fact, I'm going to come back to it right now. This is, this is it. This is that impassable spot. This is dead on the Escalante Trail to the Mix Pass. And man, if you've got pack animals, this is an impassable spot. But people did it. You know, if you're hiking, it's not that bad. A little bit of scrambling, not too bad. Now, of course, we call it Dominguez Pass. But we know uh, the route in the past was used for centuries uh, by Native Americans. Um, I've been told I'm not allowed to call it a horse. Uh, you can decide what kind of quadruped you think it is. Uh, this is such a nice petroglyph. You know, it's one of those places, the more you look at this, the more detail you see. Uh, the only other thing I'm going to point out here is this really nice sunburst. <clears throat> now this is how I learned about the Mingus Pass, uh, Michael Kelsey, uh, kind of an infamous guy in southern Utah. Uh, since this book, book came out, he's kind of made a cottage industry out of this. He has, you know, uh, dozens of different variations on, on his original guide and so on. Um, I think he's become a little less popular in, in recent times. My, my wife always threatened to write a, a book called uh, Michael Kelsey Translated into English with readable, <laughs> with readable maps. And if you've ever looked at his book, you might understand that. But we learned about the Mingus Pass from, this, from uh, Michael Kelsey and, and, and climbed the pass in uh, 2006. Um, I still have kind of a soft spot for him. You know, quite honestly, once you've been to one of the spots that he, uh, he directs you to, I can't understand any of it, but once I've gone there, it almost starts making sense. <laughs> uh, so you start out from Lee's Ferry, going up the Korea, it's one way to, one, one way to do it, uh, and uh, you're looking for a break in the cliffs uh, on the east side. Um, and before you get to that break in the cliffs, if you just turn around and look, you can actually see a good part of the trail. You can see those sand dunes up there, and then that uh, push to the top, and that's that impassable spot right there at the top. And then there's a short, easy traverse to a broader open section. And here's, here's that break in the cliffs. Uh, you might notice the boulder over here on the right. That's kind of interesting. Uh, just ignore those tourists there. <laughs> uh, let's take a close look at the boulder. Boy, this doesn't show up very well. Can you see that? This is a, a, a pair of really nice Shaolin figures. Can you turn the lights down? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe. It's an all or nothing sort of situation. Oh, okay. right. it, 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 it doesn't matter too much. But at any, at any rate, they're, uh, you know, typical uh, Glen Canyon linear style, I'm told. And then a lot of graffiti, more modern stuff. I think in the upper right, that's probably a brand from, from uh, what I would call the historic graffiti. You wouldn't want to remove it now. And likewise, over on the side, uh, FTJ is uh, one of Warren Johnson's kids, uh, uh, Frank, uh, Frank Johnson. Uh, you know, Warren Johnson, a very important figure at the uh, Lee's Ferry. He was the ferryman from like uh, 1870 to 1890. And this is one of his sons. He raised a, quite a passel of kids there. 
Uh, so let's take a close look at the, at the topo map. Uh, the Mingus Trail is actually shown on the topo. It doesn't show up very well, so I'm going to highlight it here. Here's the, oh, I see it got cut off to boot. Uh, that's, the, that's the initial climb out of, out of uh, the pre drainage. Uh, that long slog up the, uh, up the sand, and then the final push to the top. Um, and that's that impassable spot. And before I move on here, one last thing. Look in the lower right, and here's death pockets down here. I just want to point that out because I'm going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, and here we are at the Dominguez Pass, looking east. Uh, a lot of identifiable features out there. Uh, Navajo Mountain, obviously, uh, Page, and then you can see Tower Butte and Boundary Butte and the Kaharowitz, a bunch of other stuff. Um, now, that encyclopedic book of Lee's Ferry History by P.T. Riley, uh, a wonderful reference. Don't sit down with this thing and try to read it. Uh, you know, pick it up and, and thumb through about half a page, three quarters of a page, and put me to sleep. But, um, he has some interesting things to say about uh, Dominguez and Escalante. Uh, he says, for instance, very probably was the first mounted party to traverse the ancient foot trail. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, and very well might be. He knows a lot more about it than I do. But I can't help but think that as soon as Native Americans got their hands on horses, they were going up the Dominguez Trail. That's just a <coughs> suspicion. Uh, and then he makes a comment that Pioneers uh, often call the trail the sand trail for obvious reasons. Uh, there are a lot of sandy features uh, around this country, though. And then the one last thing he, he uh, mentions in his book is a party that got lost trying to come to Dominguez Pass from the backside. And the pass is more difficult to find from the backside. Some people say notoriously difficult. Uh, and, and maybe I'll get to that if we don't, uh, if we don't uh, uh, punk out before this. Um, so this is Nora Condell's impression of going up the Mingus Pass. So uh, <clears throat> Nora Condell was a British artist. Uh, she climbed the pass in 1936. Um, went out on an astonishing trip. My, my wife talked about this in, in January. Um, but she went out with Ed Fisher, who was the uh, a local guy, uh, actually lived at the Wilson Ranch, which was a little further upstream than the, uh, the turn to Dominguez. Uh, you won't find much there anymore, but it's the site of the spring. Um, and he also, uh, she also went out with David Laurie, the, the son of uh, Buck Laurie, the owner at uh, uh, the owner and builder of, of the lodge of Marble Canyon. And she wrote about this, this trip in her memoir, Unsentimental Journey. And it's, it's an astonishing trip she took. 16 days out, they went all the way up to Rock Creek. But she talked about how terrified she was going up this spot. Interestingly enough, when she came back down 16 days later, she said, it was so easy she could have put on lipstick. <laughs> uh, and just another impression. This is also an impression of her, her facilities at, uh, at uh, Buck Laurie's uh, accommodations, what he called Vermilion Cliffs Lodge. Um, it didn't take the name Marble Canyon until Hubble came along. He didn't like uh, the name Vermilion Cliffs. And he took Buck Laurie's sign and threw it away. Uh, someone else came along and took it, picked it up, took it a couple miles up the road and started their own place. <laughs> and then Cathedral Rock. This, the only other thing I want to say about Nora is I want to mention the plaque. I, I, uh, I think some of you have been out to this plaque. Uh, I've uh, always liked this. Has returned to rest in the place she loved, the place I loved too. And uh, her ashes were scattered at this plaque 
in uh, 1948, uh, um, wasn't it? Yeah, 49. Yeah. Um, but here's the location. As you cross Navajo Bridge and you turn right into uh, to go to Lee's Ferry, uh, you only have to go about 50 yards or so. Look, look over left and you'll see a uh, five mile point here on the horizon. And you know, there are all these Chenaran <coughs> boulders that have fallen off the cliff line there. And uh, right there is her plaque. You can actually see it from the road, but pull over and go out and look for it. How many have actually seen it? All right, okay, good. I'll stop preaching the choir. Um, here's another guy that climbed the pass in uh, 1935. Uh, this is Minor Tillotson. He came to the Grand Canyon in 1922. You know, uh, <coughs> the Grand Canyon became a national park in 1919, so he came along to the park pretty early, and he stayed for a long time, eventually became superintendent. And then even after he left, and went off to become Southwest Regional Director in Santa Fe, he had a lot of influence on what happened in this area. Uh, anyone recognize that? This is from his family album. I, don't, uh, I assume this is taken in 1935, and I'm not sure. So from the, from the river, obviously, Horseshoe Bend. I like to say it's the, the first Nolan picture of Horseshoe Who knows? Uh, but this, this photo just it, it just puzzled me for years uh, because it said the, the title of it is Tillotson in the Prairie Region. And I looked at that and I thought, why aren't you over in the Grand Canyon? What are you doing in my neck of the woods? <laughs> and uh, just, uh, it puzzled me a lot. And then this one really puzzled me, just called Trail from Korea Creek. And we looked at that and wondered about where that was taken for a several years before we finally went out and figured it out. Um, but uh, we didn't know if it was Dominguez Pass, or some given the story away, it's Dominguez Pass. But it could have been some, it could have been, you know, something further upstream, maybe Bushhead or Adams Trail. Um, not the Spencer Trail, because you don't have to go up the Priya to start on the Spencer Trail. Of course, we didn't figure that out until we hiked it looking for this photo. But that's, that, that was a nice hike. Um, let me just back up for a second. See his ranger hat? Look at those leather chaps. Let's take a close up of this. Can you see ranger hat, leather chaps, standing with that hair pose? <laughs> um, and then another guy over, over to the right. Uh, we later learned that was George Fisher, uh, the younger brother to Ed Fisher. Of course, Ed Fisher had been the guide for, for Nora, and uh, George Fisher turned out to be the guide for Tillotson. Fishers were local guides, and there's a spring uh, near Lee's Ferry named for uh, the brothers. Um, so we, we finally matched the photo. Uh, you see, you see that feature right there, uh, pretty much the same rock over here. And you can see a, a bunch of uh, uh, similar uh, points of comparison. Um, but let's, let's zoom in a little bit uh, on uh, Dominguez Pass and make a comment. I just highlighted uh, the trail that's already on the map, uh, but just so you can see it easier. And I'm gonna say, Oops, what if we go backwards? This photo was not taken anywhere on that trail. So it was taken on this bypass route. So as you're approaching the top, instead of charging straight up to that impassable spot, there's a subtle spot where you can turn off to the right. And it's much, much easier if you have stock animals. And then it hooks up with the, with the, uh, with the regular trail. Now, uh, Dominguez and Escalante came along. Uh, they didn't have a guide. They went charging uh, straight up the slope, uh, mentioned how impassable it was. 
I guess the USGS uh, surveyors uh, didn't have a guide either, because that's the trail they, they mapped out. And the first time I climbed the trail, that's what I did. I went straight up. Uh, and it wasn't until we'd gone out there two or three times that we figured out the bypass route. Um, you think Native Americans knew about that bypass route? <laughs> yeah, I kind of suspect. There's no glyph along it. As a matter of fact, all the glyphs on uh, the Dominguez Pass Trail are lower down. And by the time you're this high, I don't know of any glyphs in this area. And as a matter of fact, I don't know of any glyphs on the backside either. Does, has anyone seen any glyphs on the backs? I never have. I just don't know whether I just haven't been lucky enough to find them or what. But I just find that curious. Um, and this is, this is uh, on that bypass route, just a little rock corral. Uh, it's, a, like I say, a much, much easier route for stock animals. Tillotson and Nora, of course, had guys to take it through the easier spot. Um, so we had figured out where the Tillotson photo was taken. Uh, but we didn't know what he was doing there. I mean, I, I, for all I knew at that time, he was on vacation. I, I didn't have any idea. Uh, we went to the Grand Canyon Museum collection, a very nice archive with tons of stuff on Tillotson, and they had no information about him being in this area. As a matter of fact, it just got kind of like, really, he went up there? Uh, and Cindy even, even uh, wrote to the National Archives. There are some Tillotson files at the National Archives uh, to see if, if uh, she could get any information and, and uh, uh, just drove my and likewise, the Utah State Archives didn't have anything. Um, but this was something else going on in the Park Service in 1935. It was, uh, they were planning this huge national monument called Escalante National Monument. And they were just putting it together in 1935. And Minor Tillotson and uh, his colleague, Roger Toll, the, the superintendent from Yellowstone, did the field work. Uh, of course, it's a huge, vast area. A lot of the field work they did by plane, but you know, it's a huge, huge area. Um, and we also knew that this this area here eventually became Canyonlands. Of course, the Escalante plan <coughs> flopped, but this area uh, eventually became Canyonlands. I think in 1962. And uh, my wife sat down with a copy of the administrative history of, of, of Canyonlands, uh, even to the point of reading references. Mm -hmm. So you know how obsessed someone is who reads references. <laughs> um, and she ran across this reference, and I'm just going to read the highlighted section here. According to several sources, the complete, re the complete report on the Escalante National Monument from Tulsa has been missing since the 1970s, with fragments of the documents found in various memos and so on. But the really interesting part was this reference, which stands for Glen Canyon National Recreation Area Archives. Now, who would think to look in a place like that? Glen Canyon didn't even exist uh, until 1972. You're gonna, that's where you're going to look to find out about something in 1935? <laughs> well, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, and interestingly enough, my wife was volunteering in the archives and went and pulled the file. And out fell this nice uh, story. And of course, the irony of you know spending all this time looking everywhere else and finding it uh, right under your fingernails. Uh, it starts with this guy. Uh, Arno uh, Kammerer, who was the Park Service Director in 1935. And he was looking at a map, uh, probably very much like this, prepared by Tulletson or Toll. You can see the proposed Escalante National Monument in the upper right, uh, put into a larger context here. And he looked at that, 
And then he looked at this section right down here and said, now wait a second, you've got that huge stretch of the Colorado River in Utah. What, what about all this Colorado River? It goes all the way down to the Grand Canyon, almost to the Grand Canyon, back when the Grand Canyon was a lot smaller. He said, what's wrong with that? And then he said, uh, go look at it. Tell me, tell me about it. Uh, so they did. Uh, oh yeah, one other thing I want to mention that tickles me about this map. Uh, here, Navajo Bridge is called Lee's Ferry Bridge. Of course, the first name for Navajo Bridge was Grand Canyon Bridge. That was a lousy name because it didn't go over the Grand Canyon, it went over Marble Canyon. Uh, so they changed it. They changed it to Lee's Ferry Bridge for the proximity to Lee's Ferry. Uh, people in Utah didn't like that. Uh, Lee was not very popular in, in Utah. So they changed it again to the Navajo Bridge and it's a better name anyway. So uh, in, in that uh, archive file at Glen Canyon was this very nice detailed trip report that went on for three or four pages. And just to show you how detailed, uh, Tullison and Toll uh, left the Grand Canyon, the South Rim, Friday, December 6th, 1935, at 2 p.m. And they got the Reese Ferry about 6, and they uh, pulled into Leo Weaver's place, what he called the uh, Paradise Canyon, what we call Lonely Dell now. Uh, we still call it the Weaver Ranch House. But that's where they stayed that night. And then in the morning, George Fisher came along with six horses, three pack horses and three saddle horses, and all the camping gear, and they set out up the Perea. And climbed out at the Mingus Pass. This is pretty washed out, but you kind of, kind of get the picture. Uh, interesting, uh, Roger Toll is the photographer. There aren't any photos of him on this trip. But, uh, so they climbed out to the Dominguez Pass to what, what they called East Perea Bench, what we now call Three Swale. And they camped this, that night in, in uh, this uh, alcove uh, out by Death Pockets. It was kind of an intermittently rainy day, so it was nice to have some shelter. Pretty easy to find that alcove now if you, if you go to the Death Pockets area. Really nice area. And a shot from inside looking out. Man, if they, if they brought all their stock animals up there in that alcove with them, it must have been a crowd. <laughs> Nice view out there. A lot of, lot of nice slick rock to scramble up. Um, and then this is just another map of, uh, uh, of their adventure. They also took an auto trip and went up to the Priya Plateau, but I don't want to talk about that. So this is, this is the more interesting area, this section here. So we'll, uh, we'll look at it in a little more detail here. There's Lee's Ferry. There's Dominguez Pass. There was that alcove they, they uh, spent the first night in. And then the next night, they walked up to a feature called a Thousand Pockets. Now that's, that's a nice spot. I know a lot of you have been out in, in, in Thousand Pockets. And then they camped out that night uh, on the rim overlooking the uh, Perea, and then came back the next day. A shot from Thousand Pockets. Uh, one of the shallower water pockets out there, this is just a photogenic one, of course, uh, you all know there are much deeper water pockets here. I think the name Death Pockets comes from the fact that when it rains in that area, all the water pockets that form are very shallow, and they don't last long, and if you depend on them, you're dead. That's, I don't know where else the name comes from. Um, Someone tells it and told up back to the South Rim. Uh, they sent this uh, telegram to Cameron, and just to read a line here, project already includes exceptionally large area and believe undesirable to increase further or to extend into Arizona. And so after some discussion, everyone pretty much agreed with that. And so the Escalante National Monument uh, proposal was, was limited to Utah. This, this massive area in Utah. 
Now, this plan was presented to Utah in 1936 in a series of public meetings and met with considerable uh, uh, unhappy people. Uh, and eventually, the Park Service got into negotiations with the Utah delegation, uh, and they made a lot of compromises. They, they cut the area down to uh, that, that darker shaded area uh, by the Colorado River, so they cut off considerable land mass. They had to agree to grazing rights given in perpetuity. They also agreed to allow mining access and even to allow river development. So there's nothing in this plan that would have prevented a dozen dams from going up along the river if they had decided to do that. But the plan was finally killed in 1940 by congressional vote, uh, partially because of uh, Utah opposition. And of course, everyone was being, uh, was getting very concerned about the war in Europe uh, and the impending war with the United States as well. Um, now, I can stop here. How are we, how are we doing time-wise? I guess, I guess I'll, I'll keep going a little bit. <coughs> Anyone who wants to get up and leave, you can. <laughs> just don't all, don't all rush to the door all the way. But I, I just want to talk a little bit about coming in uh, to Dominguez Pass from the backside. Uh, the way I always go is, is, to, is to take the road essentially to, uh, to a thousand pockets. Um, so you, you see that nice, what I like to call the Prairie Ridge out there. I just want to point out this feature right here, because it's a, it's, it's a feature that kind of orients you. Uh, we like to call that the cake, just because we've got this little layer on it. So, um, But you can see Highway 89 on the map there. Uh, we, take, we take the turn uh, before we get to Green Haven. Greedy Haven, I like to say, to remind myself how it's spelled. Uh, and when we get to this intersection, we always used to go straight and go down to Thousand Pockets. Uh, that's pretty much kind of the trailhead for Thousand Pockets. You probably can't see, this map doesn't show up very well, does it? And then we'd drive straight down the ferry swale uh, drainage, which is just a dreadful way to go. Uh, it's, it's terminally sandy. If you, ever came, if you ever met someone in the narrow section coming in the other direction, you'd probably both be stuck there for a year. Uh, but uh, so these days we go to this location. We take the turn, and uh, the drop down to Slick Rock looks a little scary, but it's, uh, it's actually an easier way to go. And then we go by this feature called uh, Willow Tank. It's, it's a, at, at this point, you catch a road that goes almost due south uh, past Willow Tank. Willow Tank is nothing to look at, but it's an interesting historic site because that's where Bucky O'Neill caught the bank robbers, and I forgot here. Train robbers. What? Train robbers. Train, oh, excuse me, train robbers. Do you remember the bank roll? Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, bank roll. At any rate, this is just uh, that sandy ferry swale drainage. There's, uh, there's that feature that we like to call the cake. And uh, the, the road from uh, the little tank is good for about a mile uh, before you, you hit this uh, uh, slick rock uh, rise that uh, becomes a little uh, uh, tough to negotiate. We always stop and park here. Uh, a lot of people will drive through it. But we can park here and get to Dominguez Pass in a little over an hour, probably an hour and 10 minutes. And if, you, if you're willing to beat up your vehicle enough and drive through this section, the road actually becomes better again, and you probably knock off 20 minutes from your height. Um, but this is that story that, that uh, P.T. Riley mentioned uh, about the tough time finding the backside of, of, of Dominguez Pass. So in 1872, Powell had come off the river and was in command, and he'd left all his men at the ferry. 
<clears throat> so he ordered supplies sent to them. They were uh, setting up to do the, uh, the survey of, of Southern Arizona. Uh, and he hired three, uh, three Canab guys to go out and take the supplies. Well, they decided, oh, it's gonna be a lot easier if we go by the sand trail. So they did, but they got horribly lost. And uh, they had quite a time before actually uh, Powell's men had to, had to actually rescue a, a couple of them. But here we are, standing on the backside, and uh, there's a feature that I like to call a cake. And here's the, here's the main canyon. Now, it's hard to appreciate in this, in this, uh, this photo, but you see that little level section uh, right, right in that canyon? Uh, that's actually a little piece of the Priya Plateau. And that's what I like to look for. I like to, I like to, when I see that little section of the Priya Plateau through the canyon, I have an idea that I've got the right canyon. Now, from this perspective, it looks pretty easy. But if you hike up the Spencer and come around behind and drop down the Mingus, which is incidentally an easier way to do it, uh, you pass a lot of these little canyons. And choosing the right one can be difficult. Of course, now we have electronic devices that, uh, that can help us. So the first time I walked uh, from uh, the uh, page side, uh, I just walked up the drainage. Uh, probably the first couple times we did it, we went that way. But there's actually a trail there. <laughs> and the, uh, the trail's a little hard to spot, a little hard to follow, but it's actually a little faster as well. And as you get close to the pass, we like to keep our eyes open for the big horn, like in the sky on the skyline. And just another shot. And I'm going to stop talking because I'm getting kind of punch drunk. But <laughs> I want to tell you that you can see Dominguez Pass from town. If, if it was daylight, we could, we could spot the location out the window right here. And it's kind of a fun thing to do. So uh, think about that when you're, when you're looking at that vista. Um, I would entertain questions. As long as I don't have to dodge any fruit. <laughs> Does anyone have any comments? Uh, um, yeah. Oh, uh, once they got down, once uh, Dominguez Escalante group uh, got down to the East Ferry, did they consider, or, or why didn't they just go straight up the Perea to 89? Although 89 was there, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And come out that way. I mean, it's. it's uh, that's actually not such a bad suggestion, except it is, it, it was a big unknown. No one knew, you know, they, they knew they were looking for uh, a way to cross the river. And when they were sitting at Lee's Ferry, they decided that the spot they were looking for had to be upstream. Uh, that it didn't look <laughs> downstream, that it looked very promising. And uh, of course, we know you could you could uh, go out to uh, the Priya, and that wouldn't have been that bad. Probably would have been a little longer. I don't know. They might not have been as much trouble as they had. Because once they got over the pass, they had just as much trouble then down the other side. So, uh, and I, th I think it was a struggle for them to find the find the crossing. You know, there are several locations where they managed to get Native American guides, mm -hmm. and they had a little bit of intelligence about what to look for and what to expect. But at this stage, they were all by themselves. They, really? didn't, they didn't have any guides. I was, I was thinking I remembered in the, in the uh, journal uh -huh. that they had sent out guides for a couple of days. Yeah, right, right. Except for scouts. Though. Yeah. They were I, yeah. I think it was the Menendez brothers that actually went up to the pass and said, oh yeah, we can go this way. And Did again, they get through by Skin Gulch with the rock, rock balls, with their pack animals? Uh, I'm sorry. So yeah. they, if they went up the Perea, there'd be rock falls that their pack animals probably would not be able to uh, I think they could probably, I mean, they wouldn't have gone up Buckskin Gulch. They would have, they would have, they would have come out of White House right there on 89. 
Well, John D. Lee brought the cattle down. Yeah, well, yeah. So, I mean, we know that it, you could do that. I, I think, you know, there's a story, P.T. Riley tells a story of, of an army troop going up the Priya for the first time and how scary it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know. So that was in 1776. Right. The same time they pulled up at Gunsight. Right. Us right. In super bad weather. Yes. And starving to death. Yes. And and they made they made the they made the comment that it was very cold getting over the Nimbus Pass. And as a matter of fact, I think that morning they may have even killed another horse to eat. You know, that's part of the reason they took horses with them was to. Kill them to eat them when, when uh, they ran out of food. Yeah. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you for your presentation. So I had an interesting question. Um, there's an old 49er named Al Huntington that worked with Warren Johnson. Uh huh. So he has inscriptions at a spring. Yeah, called Fisher Spring. Yeah, and I was wondering if that is credible to the source that he actually was there before John D. Lee arrived. We, we went out looking for that inscription. We never found it. No, you can't find it. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I know, I believe in the Huntington Library, there's a photo of the, the actual inscription. Yeah, I've, I think I've seen that. I, I'm glad to remember it's at the Huntington. I might pull, pull it out. Yeah. We've gone up to Fisher Spring a couple times. Uh, there's some nice petroglyphs in that vicinity, but uh, we've never found that inscription. Yeah, it was just interesting because his, his claim would be he was there before John D. Lee arrived. In the yeah, yeah, that's right. I'd forgotten that. I'd so, forgotten. Uh, I know, but Jacob Hamblin, they were there uh, in the, what, 18, late, mid-1850s? Yeah, yeah. So, of course, and it was Hamblin who recognized that, oh yeah, if we had a boat here, this lease ferry would be a good... For sure. I just didn't know if you know anything else about the inscriptions or anything that are there. Uh, no, I... I I know we knew enough to go looking for it and never, never found it. And I, what I've heard of, uh, seems like we've talked to a couple of other people and gone looking for it. Uh, wasn't there some group who claimed to also have, well, you, you mentioned the Huntington photo, yeah. So I think there were other people who probably yeah. claimed to have seen it one time. You know, it's a very unstable area. I wouldn't be surprised if it was really there. It would have been covered up anyway. But, and who knows? No, I, I don't. Well, let's call it a night.